Hello and welcome to another episode of Trash to Track. In this episode I'm going to be looking at a Dapol 14XX tank. As you can see this is covered in crud and this loco was actually one of the original locos I got with the Dean Goods that featured in episode 1. And I've had it all this time but I thought now it's time for a makeover. But I've not just got one 14XX. I have several that I've accumulated over the past year and a half. Some are in better condition than us. And indeed, this last one is just a chassis. So what I plan to do is I plan to make two good models out of the four bits and pieces that I've got here. I'm also going to remove the traction tire driving wheel and exchange it for one without a tire on. So that um, all wheels properly pick up. And there's not really any need for traction tires on this model as these little tank engines weren't known for hauling great lengths. So it'll be fine without them. This second one... Um, I'm going to do the same too, but this I'm actually going to paint BR black and transform it into a film star. This heavily damaged model is going to be used for spares, as is the chassis. Now the chassis has got a bit better wheels on it than that other 14XX that damaged. So doing a quick battery test, we can see that this original 14XX, number 1466, is trying to run. It does need a service, it won't run more than a few millimetres without stalling. So the plunger pickups will need um, cleaning and I imagine it needs a complete overhaul. This second one that I'm going to transform into 1401, um, Star of the Titfield Thunderbolt, that runs as well but again very intermittently. This one here is broken, the wire's broken, so doing a battery test of the motor terminals. Proves that the motor works, so that's at least good for a spare motor and wheel set, if nothing else. And this last one also tries to run, but out of all four, this is probably the, in the poorest condition running-wise and decoration-wise. So I'm going to concentrate on just one of the overhauls during this video. As I said, this one here will be transformed into 1401, star of the uh, Titfield Thunderbolt. And the other one, the original green one, I'm going to leave as 1466 as it came out of the factory. So there are several screws to undo to get the model apart. The first screw is down the chimney. This is a small flathead screw that you undo. And the chimney comes off and this releases the body from the body shell. As at the back it is held in place with a small clip. There's the chimney come off. Now I, I thought that this big screw under here was holding the body shell on as well. So I erroneously took this out. Now what this screw does, this actually holds the motor in place. It's got nothing to do with the body shell whatsoever. But as I lift it up there, the frame uh, chassis just falls out. And you can see that the motor's loose. And that is because I took that big screw away. So these motors in here look to be five pole. We'll give this body shell a clean up later on. It looks to be in good condition. No detail parts are missing. It's just horrendously coated in grime and hair and God knows what. So this big screw, like I said, this goes through the chassis and holds the motor in place. But now I've removed it, I'll leave it because I'm going to have to remove the motor from this model. As I'm also going to digitally fit these before we reassemble them. These motors are five pole motors and actually look to be quite good quality. So we'll have a look at those later on. To strip the rest of the chassis down, you have to undo a screw underneath the in the chassis keeper plate. And also on the top here on the sandbox details. This front part with the worm drive lifts away. And then the chassis can unclip. Now when you unclip the chassis on these models, be very careful. There are four tiny metal spacer pieces that will fall off and go everywhere like they did with me. If you're unaware that they're there. So that is the model basically stripped down. And as I said before this has got plunger pickups. So that will be interesting. These will need fully servicing. Looking at the model. The plunger pickups don't appear to be in too bad condition. But there's a lot of old grime and gunk. That's built up on this model over the years. These are those metal spacing pieces that I mentioned. Um, don't lose them. I lost a couple. It took me ages to find them. So using a cotton butter mess, I'm going to remove this old grease and grime from the chassis plate here. And we're going to clean this all up. So as I mentioned before, um, this 14XX I'm working on now was part of the original six engines I bought when I started Trash to Track nearly two years ago. And it's been sat in storage since. So that could have uh, equated to why this 
old grease has solidified. So after cleaning the trailing wheel, I clean all the grease off the chassis block. There is quite a lot of crud and fluff all built upon this. Um, in all the screw holes, in all the holes in the chassis, there's just horrible thick old grease. You can see it there, it looks a bit like earwax. But using cotton bud and methylated spirits, this was all removed back to the metal. And this spring piece at the back here that holds that rear wheel in the place on the track was also given a thorough cleaning. Now, looking at the motor, this looks to be in relatively good condition. I'm going to have to trim this protrusion out the bottom here. As originally, the model picked up its electricity from the base plate straight through the chassis to the brush. But as I'm digitally fitting this, I'm going to have to do some modifications so that the motor is completely isolated from the chassis. I can't remove the brushes on this motor very easy, so I'm going to clean the commutator by rotating it against this cotton bud with methylated spirits. I then polish the commutator up as it was quite dirty and some of the carbon buildup had actually um, kind of like embedded itself in the brass. I then clean the gaps out in the commutator to remove any built up carbon as this can lead to short circuits and poor running. And then I also polish it up again once more with a carbon bit of meths. I also just brush off any loose fibres there from that fibreglass pencil. Using a pencil here, I'm going to mark that coil and I'm going to turn the motor to count the poles. Now, this Type 7 motor only has three poles, so when Hornby upgraded their chassis, it was actually a retrograde step as these motors from Dapole are five pole. The more poles on a motor, the smoother the running. So I'm surprised they did that. Just proves that they used cheaper motors than what Dapol did. Now to change the wheels out, all I did was I got a pair of blunt side snips and gently prized the crank pin out of the wheel to release the side rods. Do this on both sides and this will release the wheel with the groove in it for the traction tyre. And then using one of the spare chassis I've got for parts, um, not this one because the, the plating has come off the wheels there and you can see they're quite a coppery colour. So that will attract dirt relatively quickly. But the other chassis, the wheel on here, has its plating so it's actually going to work out better at doing this. So I'm going to strip this model down into its component pieces and release that spare wheel. Now naively I thought that the quartering would be correct as I've removed it from another model. However, you'll see that um, after cleaning, um, I clean all these side rods up with a cotton bud and meths, and I also clean the wheels and axles up. You can see here that I've removed the other crank pins because there was some hair and fibre wrapped around them. Now, I was going to put the side rods back on, um, and the quartering didn't match. The wheels on the model were relatively clean, and all they required was a going over with a cotton bud and meths. I also clean the wheel backs as those plunger pickups press onto the wheel backs that everything must be clean to allow good electrical conductivity. So as I was saying, I thought the quartering would match because I've taken them off the model and not adjusted it in any way. So I put one of the crank pins back in the wheel. These are a friction fit and they're put in a hole and then they are just pushed in with a flat bladed screwdriver like that. I line up this crank pin, push that in. And then when I turn the model around to put the other side on, I notice that the wheels don't align. Now you will notice that the balance weights on the wheels don't line up. This is correct and typical for a tank engine like this. The balance weights did not line up. And here you can see we have a problem. Um, the crank pins on this side do not match up. So even though I didn't want to do it, I'm going to have to take a wheel off the axle and adjust the quartering on one of the wheels. So the way I do that is I have a wheel pulling tool. And in a moment when I stop farting around with these wheels, you will see me using it. So the wheel pulling tool is basically this. I bought this many years ago from Eileen's Emporium, I think. And you basically clamp the wheel onto those two uh, stanchions that come out the bottom. You adjust it um, to the diameter of the wheel. And then you basically turn this um, screw piece here. And it pushes the axle and simultaneously pulls the wheel off the axle. 
It's there I noticed that I've got a bit of fibre stuck in my finger as it really hurts. So there I'm trying to pull it out. That was from when I cleaned the motor up earlier on. But yeah, turning that bit and it pulls the wheel off. So now that the wheel's off, I can now adjust the quartering on this one wheel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the rest of the um, side rods. I'm going to replace them onto the original wheel from this model and then push the crank pin home with a pair of smooth um, smooth jaws, smooth jawed uh, small pliers just to make sure that it's in and fully home. And then I'm going to put the wheels in the chassis block um, just to aid me lining them all up and getting the quartering correct. So I'm just going to line the axles up in the chassis block here like this. Make sure that the crank pins are at, um, on this side they are at, at 9 o'clock. And then on the bottom there they should be at 6 o'clock. So this took a couple of attempts. I loosely put the wheel on the axle and then try and line up the crank pins by eye. You can see there that I've done it, it's just slightly off that time, so it doesn't line up. So I'm going to have to then remove the wheel again. Because I didn't push it fully home, I can remove it with uh, finger pressure. But now this side, the wheels are at the 6 o'clock position. I'm just going to check the other side. They're still at 9 o'clock. So now I push the wheel fully home, and hopefully I've got this quartering correct. So I just bring the side rod around there and then push the other crank pin in place. Now if this is done correctly, and everything is as it should be, when this crank pin's in place, and I put the wheels back in the chassis, it should run relatively smoothly, with no locking up and no kinks. So again, I just push the crank pin back in there. So putting all three axles back in the chassis, I start to roll it and notice that it's locking up. So I think I've got the quartering wrong again. However, it wasn't the quartering. When I put it on the track, I noticed that the plunger pickups are in the wrong place. So when I just flick them up, I'm going to have to remove them for cleaning anyway. But when I remove the plunger pickups, you can see that the chassis runs nice and freely with no tight spots, which means now the quartering is correct. So I'm happy that we've done that uh, to the wheels. The magnet on this mo uh, motor is extremely strong. Um, I'm just going to release that tiny screw there to release that big brass strip because I'm going to need to remove that when I fit this model with a DCC decoder. There's no need for any remagnification. As you'll see later, the magnet is actually so powerful, later on it does cause me a couple of problems. But these plunger pickups, these have now been soaked in contact cleaner and have been thoroughly cleaned. And working through the spares that I managed to obtain, I managed to find six um, working plunger pickups. There were a couple that had had it, so they went in the bin. But you actually need 12 for two models, so I went through and I managed to get 12 pickups out of the four models that we are um, that we have at our disposal this time. These simply just fit into the chassis like that. They are a friction fit. They're also a friction fit into the plastic base plate. It is a good idea, these plunger pickups, and if they're properly cleaned and lubricated with some Pico power lube, they are actually a very, um, a very good method of transferring power from the wheels to the motor. So these um, metal spacer pieces, they sit in that small groove that's cast into the chassis block there. These just keep the plastic base plate where it should do. And now I'm putting the wheels back in and that pony wheel at the back there, it might, it's not sitting level at the moment, because it's being pushed to one side by that pickup. Same with the driving wheels. The plunger pickups are actually pushing the wheel off to one side. So lining the wheels up, I use a small flat-bladed screwdriver just to align those pickups to the wheels. Small amount of oil, as there's no proper bearings in this model. The wheels simply sit in the die casting. And I'm going to apply a small amount of silicon grease to this drive gear. I will also put some on the motor worm gear and the worm gear in that piece removed earlier. Once that's done, the base plate is lowered on again with the help of a small flat bladed screwdriver just to push those plunger pickups in behind the wheels because it is quite a tedious job because you can guarantee you'll get um, five out of the six in place and then one will pop out of the way. 
But eventually, and with some patience, we managed to get everything in where it should be. The base plate just simply clips on. And there we go, look, one of the pickups has actually fallen out. They are quite fiddly and tedious, but they are worth it, as they do um, allow for good electrical conductivity. So once that's back in place, this is the worm gear here. I'm just going to get a cotton bit of mess and clean out any excess and old oil and grease. And in fact, I didn't realise until just now that I can actually remove that part in its entirety. It just simply lifts out. So now that's been lifted out, I can clean all of this old gunk out, take it back to bare metal and remove any of the old lubrication and dirt. So a small amount of silicon grease on that worm gear, along with a little tiny drop of oil on those bearing, on those bearings that are in there. And you'll see that the front sandpipes are actually cast into this part of the Dapol 14XX. And this just simply sn snugly fits in the die casting and is reattached with that small flat headed screw that we removed earlier. So we're well on the way to rebuilding this model now. However, ha I have forgot to do one thing. I'm going to have to remove the base plate again as I forgot to solder on a pickup wire to that brass strip. So I've done it now and this green wire is a pickup wire for the DCC decoder. The motor has had that pinion um, snipped and I solder the grey wire from the decoder directly to that as that goes to the brushes. And once that's soldered in place, I insulate that with a piece of heat shrink tubing to ensure that there's no danger of that touching the metal chassis. As if that was to happen, you'd end up with a, a quite a bad short circuit and you'll end up blowing your decoder. The orange terminal wire was soldered to the other brass brush retainer there. So that's your orange and grey to the motor. And then just testing it gently with a battery to make sure you can see the motor is spinning so the wires are in the correct place and there's that heat shrink going over that bottom uh, pin there and then I shrink that in place with heat off my soldering iron. So now that's all been done this is quite a snug fit now as you've got two wires going down the side of that die casting whereas before there weren't any but with a slight bit of persuasion the motor will fit back into place and if you do this ensure that you get those drive shafts lined up they will only go in one way the drive shaft is semicircular and fits in its semicircular hole and then the screw that we removed earlier that holds the motor in place was replaced and now the pickup wires have been attached it was tested with a battery and you can see that the chassis is running nicely having been fitted with a dcc decoder so now I'm inverting the model to make and testing each wheel individually to make sure all those pickups are working. And there is a problem with the front ones. So again, these were fettled um, and seated correctly. And after that, all six wheels on this model are picking up electricity. Now the body shell itself is in very good condition, as I said. This one here I'm going to paint black. Um, the other one I'm just going to give a good wash with a uh, toothbrush in some warm soapy water. This one appears to have what looks like PVA glue spillage all over the top. So I'm going to remove as much of this as I can with my scalpel. And then to remove the body side markings, I'm just going to gently scrape these away with my fiberglass pencil. It doesn't take a lot to remove the dapple printing from the sides. And it actually leaves a small mark in the side of the body shell where the branding was. Now, I'm going to need this as a reference later on, as you'll see. So I'm actually quite pleased that this left a slight mark on the body shell. Other things to be removed before I prime the body shell are the whistles. And there is only one on this one's missing. So I'll have to source another one in my spares box. And the coal load on this model is also removable. So that was taken out as well. Handrails were fixed and it was given it was given a clean and then primed up ready. So this is the original body shell. This is the first 14XX I got along with that Dean Goods. Looks pretty manky, but after a nice wash in hot water and hot soapy water, the body shell came up absolutely beautiful, as you can see here. Now I've not embellished this in any way. This is simply how it came up after being washed. I've refitted the vacuum pipes on the front. And it really does look the part. It's a proper smart little Great Western tank engine. Now the other body shell was primed and painted black with a hum with a Halford satin black. Um, the 
buffer beams were masked, so that's the original red on there. And I also made a front smoke box number plate bracket out of 80,000 plastic card. Now, as I said, you can just see those marks through that black paint, but I'm going to need those later anyway. And Railtech printed me some 3D printed number plates for this, which I'm going to now attach. Now, you'll, want, you'll see me attaching these um, as the normal way with transfers using water, but you can also um, put these onto wet varnish, um, and it's recommended that you loosen them in water and apply them onto wet varnish. Now, the 1401 and the smoke box door plate there have gone on the front, um, and the bracket I made is the exact size, so I'm happy with that. And then I'm just going to adjust the smoke box um, shed code plate there with the cocktail stick. And then the numbers on the side were positioned on the mark where the original numbers were rubbed away with the fiberglass pencil. Now after I'd done this, as per usual, I gave my model a coat of varnish, but I unfortunately encountered a massive problem. I bought some satin varnish from a new shop who ensured me it was acrylic. And when I gave the model a coat of varnish, it wasn't. It was enamel and reacted very badly with the painted finish underneath. I was extremely lucky in being able to salvage these transfers. All four transfers were salvaged. Um, the model was stripped in Revel paint remover. And the model was again resprayed from uh, scratch. I had to repaint the buffer beams and everything. But this all happened after what you're seeing here. So I refit the whistles here using my tweezer nose pliers. And 1401 is coming up to its... Um, coming to look like its Titfield Thunderbolt uh, guys. Although it is slightly clean, so I might have to send this off for weathering when I finish this video. Now, the whistles were quite fiddly to fit. I actually um, had to open the holes up slightly with a 0.5mm drill. And this is the whistle I got out of my spares box. I think it's off a Triangle Nelly Loco. But I just dab a tiny amount of super glue on the end there and push that into the hole. And then this 1400 tank has got its two whistles back. So that is the model virtually reassembled back into, uh, as I said, filming condition. So while that all sets, I'm going to replace the couplings. These are the original Dapol couplings. They are quite narrow. But I'm going to replace them with these Hornby type um, that just clip into the place. Now, you'll see here the problem I mentioned earlier with that magnet. The magnet on this motor is so strong that when the couplings are in place, and I replaced them on the Great Western tank as well, it has a nasty habit of pulling those coupling hooks up towards the back of the bunker. And I'll show you what I mean very shortly. But when I'm trying to couple up, it more often than not, the rear coupling hook is sticking up in the air. So this is the body shell after it had been stripped and repainted. And you can see there how I managed to salvage the transfers, which I was extremely lucky to be able to do. And now I'm going to marry up this body shell with this chassis and the AE models decoder. Um, space is very limited in this model, so the decoder actually sits in the cab roof. There you can see that problem I'm on about with the magnet and that coupling hook. It keeps pulling it up. And the last piece to go in is that removable coal load from the back. Now, if I'd have thought about it, I could have put a piece of plastic card in there and actually put real coal in this, which is probably what I will do in the future. The last thing to go on the body show are these plastic pipe renditions. These sit in two holes that are in the chassis keeper plate and also through tiny locating holes that are in the body shell. So I'm just going to put those in there like that and then push the little tabs in place. And again, after spraying, again, I'm now back to refitting these whistles, which was a fiddly job in the first place. But having had to remove them once for repainting and stripping, I'm now putting them back in. To reassemble this model, it was the same, screw down the chimney and the clip at the back. So the filming model of 1401 had very clear indentations on the body side where the film crew had painted out GWR, which is why I wanted those marks on the body side so that I could actually hand paint some black, um, some black splodges on the side over where the GWR would have been. 
This is a screen accurate representation of how 1401 looked when it had a starring role in the Titfield Thunderbolt. I've wanted a model of this particular loco for quite some time as I've got the Rapido Titfield pack and it just sets it off quite nicely. You'll see here just how well these 1400 tanks run on DCC with a quality decoder and a 5 pole motor. I mean this will hold a candle to any modern model for slow speed running and having had that traction tyre wheel removed it has had no difference on its running capabilities whatsoever. I think you'll agree that that is a very nice smooth running loco. So now that these locos have been uh, thoroughly cleaned and rebuilt and digitally, digitally fitted let's remind ourselves of what we started with with the Great Western tank that like I said was one of the original locos I got um, as a Demic for Trash to Track. It's covered in dirt, filthy, and I mean it did run but not very well. And uh, I've stripped this down uh, to its individual screws and pickups and given it a thorough overhaul and a jolly good clean up as it was encrusted with this horrible dirt and uh, dust. And now it's been cleaned up it looks very very nice indeed the dappled paint finish has come up lovely having had a nice hot wash in soapy water and then of course the other one was repainted um in all overall black to represent 1401 as it starred in the titfield thunderbolt in 1953 if you've got an engine you'd like to see featured on an episode of trash to track please email me at dansmodelrowers at gmail.com and we'll have a look again at it sent over, and who knows, it may even feature in an episode all of its own. I'm going to leave you now with some shots of the 1400 tanks running round. Uh, 1401 running with the filming train set, uh, the Rapido Titfield Buffet Car, Cattle Wagon and GWR Goods Van. And the Great Western Tank will be pushing a auto trailer around the layout. Now you will see the black one runs absolutely smoothly and lovely. The Great Western one is a little bit intermediate and this is because one of the wheels has got that plating uh, issue on it. So I am going to replace that in the future. Thanks for watching Trash to Track. Please like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you all again in the next video. Bye for now.